Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be, I'm, I'm, I just need to own that I'm nervous and I'm rarely nervous when giving Dharma talks anymore, but I'm nervous. So just putting that out there. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be talking today about um, this kind of collapse freeze energy um, that so often happens um, when we in our lives, when we're meditating, a normal part of being alive. Um, and sometimes that sometimes when we're even just talking about collapse energy, um, you know, we're, we're very porous beings, which is beautiful because we have an impact on each other. But sometimes just talking about collapse can kind of make us feel that way. So my invitation to you is to really take care of yourself. If you're, um, you know, and you can play with it. You can be like, ah, oh, I'm gonna turn off my screen and see how that feels. I'm gonna get up and move around a little bit and see how that feels. Really respecting your body. Um, I often sway. Um, and so if you're catching your body do, doing something to really just honor that. Um, yeah, okay. So let's start with um, just an opening stationary practice. Hmm. And so we're gonna do a little resourcing practice. So finding a posture that feels right for you in this moment. It could be standing, sitting, lying down, or walking. And turning inwards, that might mean Closing the eyes or lowering them, gaze down. We're taking a moment to really notice the earth. Noticing the parts of your body that are touching the earth. And then just dropping the inquiry in. Can I let go into the earth just a little bit more? And so I'd like you to remember a time recently where you felt safe and connected. This might be in nature, with a pet, with people, or something else entirely. And to take a minute and, and really take in the surroundings that were there. What was the sky like? Were there any trees or plants around? If there were people there, or pets or other animals, can you notice their faces? Maybe noticing laughter, tranquility. How do you know in your body what sensations tell you that this is what safe and connected feels like? 
Is it a, is it a warmth, a tingling, expansion? Maybe noticing any textures in the room. Maybe you're sitting on something or feeling the sun on your skin. Taking in what feels good. And if this is at all a challenge for you, it's absolutely okay. There's no right or wrong way to be here. You can just return your attention back to the breath, back to the earth. And we'll give it just another moment of savoring safety, savoring connection. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, so a little bit about me if you don't know me. Um, so I've been practicing since 2004. I have been, um, uh, I was trained uh, with Coral um, with True North Insight um, to offer community dharma talks and um, and lead to lead sanghas. And also I have done some training in somatic experiencing. I used to work as a therapist. And so a lot of what I'm gonna be offering here today is, is a real hybrid of uh, where Buddhism and nervous system work meet, which is like delicious nerdery for me. Um, and I am a little bit outdated in some of this stuff. And so if there are other nervous system nerds here who are like, ooh, 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 ooh um, please, Please type it in the chat, because um, yeah, there's let's let's um harvest the beautiful wisdom in this room together. Okay, so this talk came about um, because a, a few weeks, maybe a week ago, um, Coral sent me a message being like, "Hey, what's your talk about? We've got to create like the little outreach flyer for it." And um, for folks, I. I can't, I think I, yes, I did give a, like, did I give a talk here a month ago? I can't remember. Um, but the last time I was here, I think I was talking about pain and it's because I've been in a lot of pain. I've had a now an eight week long migraine. It's here right now. It's very, very faint, but it's been eight weeks of pretty excruciating pain. And, um, and so it's been very, very difficult to work with, you know? So um, the Buddha has a metaphor around how we work with pain and it, he talks about it as arrows. You know, the first noble truth is that they're suffering. That is the first arrow. Shit happens, you know? That might be getting stuck in traffic. That might be not doing well on a test. Whatever it is, there's things that are hard that happen. That's the first arrow. And then very often, and this is the second noble truth, we add a whole bunch of unnecessary arrows to the traffic. So there's traffic happening, it sucks. And then we kind of, our mind will sort of take us into mental proliferations, into all these thoughts. And the next thought might be, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be late to work because there's traffic. And then the third thought is, oh my God, I'm gonna get fired. And then the fourth thought is, 
I'm going to be destitute and I'm going to lose everything in the world. And, and we all know this. Like I can see some people smiling, you know, we all know this. This is so human. And this is what the Buddha named as the second arrow, third arrow, fourth arrow. And so working with, with migraine has been a giant ride and being in the thousandth arrow, you know, starting with, oh, there's pain. Okay. I'm a long-term meditator. I know how to be with this. Okay. Throbbing, pulsing, unpleasant, you know, all the different ways we can be with what's here instead of kind of flying into the thoughts and, and getting hooked by them. And yet pain is really hard, you know? Um, so I went from there's pain to, I should be really worried about this, right? This could be really bad to, you know, the 30th era, which is I definitely have a brain tumor, you know, um, and getting really stuck there. And so when Coral messaged me, I'd be like, hey, what are you offering? I was in the, I am probably going to be de dead place. You know, <laughs> that's really where I was of like, this is so bad. And so I can't remember what I exactly, what exactly what I said, but I sort of responded with something like, I don't have the capacity for this right now. Yeah. And that's like maybe one of my least favorite phrases in the world. So when I hear myself say it, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't love that I said that. There's some places where I need to investigate. And you know, the, the Buddha says to be with whatever is here, whatever is here as it's here. So whether you're at the first arrow, whether you're at the sensations, or whether you're at the thousandth arrow, you're just supposed to be with what's here as it's here. No judgment about where, about um, about being with what mental proliferation. And so I was sitting with it and going, oh, that feels outside of my sila, sila's ethics. This idea that I made a commitment to being here today, and I made a commitment to... Um, uh, you know, to doing all the pieces involved with getting there today, which includes outreach, which includes telling dear, lovely, generous Coral what um, what we were going to be doing today, you know? And so I sat with that going, oh, that doesn't feel quite right. And I was like, oh, yes, I'm speaking from that kind of, you know, hundredth arrow instead of speaking from this real present moment. And that's not to say that we shouldn't have boundaries. Sometimes we really don't have the capacity for things, but when we can examine that, um, not from the place of the hundredth arrow, but from this present moment, we can often make a more accurate assessment instead of just kind of pushing away um, what feels overwhelming. Maybe it's not overwhelming. And so what I said to Coral was, huh, maybe I should talk about the intense collapse that I'm in right now. Because <laughs> that's what's here. That's all, all I can do is talk about what's here right now. So that's how this talk came to be. Okay. So what is collapse? Um, so collapse is a form of hypo arousal. Yeah. So um, oftentimes when nervous system nerds are talking about um, collapse, they interchange that with freeze. There's kind of two types of freeze generally. There's this kind of like deer and headlights freeze, which is kind of tied with like a fight flight energy. And then there's a more hypo aroused kind of freeze, which is what I'll be talking about today, which is called collapse. And collapse really lives on a continuum, right? It's not like when you think about collapse, you can think of like, um, you know, um, when the lion is chasing the gazelle and the gazelle has gazelles running, right? And then it's like, oh, I'm not going to make it. I'm just going to fall and collapse on the ground. That's what we think of when we think of collapse. At least that's what I think of. And it can be like that, right? But it can also be like very intense looping thoughts. You know, for me, it comes up with a lot of self-hatred. It can look like wanting to lie in bed all day. Um, it can look like shame, so many different things. Um, and sometimes it can really feel like a complete loss of muscle tone, but that is quite an extreme example. And that isn't usually where we are. So I'm not gonna talk about that too much today. So some of the other physical symptoms are shallow breathing, loss of muscle tone, as I said, glazed eyes, just like a numbness, not being able to feel very much. Um, brain fog, what happens when our nervous systems are encountered with a threat, as, as I was saying earlier, we often go in, we don't often, we go, when, our, when we feel like there's a threat, our systems automatically go into fight, flight, freeze. We don't have any control over this. This happens automatically. 
and the body will go into fight or flight first. And then if that's like not working, it'll go into freeze. Yeah, okay. I'm jumping all over the place. Let me just come back. To, <laughs> come back. I'm still nervous. This is what's happening. Okay. Um, emotionally, it can feel like emptiness, overwhelm, frozen, a real feeling of being stuck, grief, hopelessness, despair. You know, for me, for sure, I know that, oh, there's like a little light bulb that goes off of like, oh, I must be in collapse when I say I don't have the capacity to do this. That's like a flag for me. I can't do it. Yeah. Um, I'm unlovable. Um, you know, thoughts of deep overwhelm. Yeah. Okay. So as I said, when there's a, when there's a stressor either internally or externally, um, so it might be, um, the traffic, right. As I was talking about earlier, or it might be all of the internal thoughts, you know, the second arrow, third arrow, all of these things can act as a stressor on the body. And, and when we have that stressor, we will go into fight, flight, freeze. Um, and so when the gazelle is running away and then collapses on the ground, that is an incredibly brilliant strategy. The idea behind freeze is okay. If I collapse on the floor, right? Like if the gazelle collapses on the floor, the lion will come by and kind of sniff around and be like, oh, is this thing dead? I don't want to eat gross rotten meat. I'm going to keep going. So incredibly adaptive. And the other thing too, is if the gazelle gets eaten, there will be, it'll be way less painful because the body is really numbed out. So really, really, really adaptive. And also it's very energetically taxing. As we know, for those of us who've been in depressive episodes, we know how unbelievably exhausting it can be. So dharmically, um, I, dharma, the, the, yeah, the way that I think we can understand this is through the hindrance of sloth and torpor. So there are five hindrances. These are hindrances to practice. The Buddha talks about them. And sloth and torpor is basically sleepiness, you know, sometimes it can show up as just kind of like, you know, this kind of like nodding off that happens while you're practicing. Um, but it can also be uh, something deeper than that, like a more hypo aroused freeze straight state. And it's very unpleasant, you know, if there's enough mindfulness to notice what's happening when we're in this collapse freeze state, there, it feels really contracted underneath, you know, underneath the numbness, there's a lot of contraction, it's very little spaciousness. So of course, of course, we want to just get out of it, right? Of course, we're like, this feels terrible. I want to get out of bed. I want to get, get stuff done. And we know, according to all the teaching, according to the teachings of the Buddha, that all mind states, all emotional states, every single one is an opportunity for liberation, including and especially the ones that feel really bad. And we can have so much compassion for our go-to response to want to get out of it, you know? Um, when I was researching for this talk a little bit, I went on YouTube and just, you know, was like, oh, I should refresh on collapse and freeze and stuff. So I went on there and was like, you know, typed in like freeze, you uh, freeze or something. I don't even know what I typed in. Just like trying to get some basic information to make sure that I got it all right. And every single one of the top hits were like, hack your nervous system. This is how you get out of freeze. And I was like, whoa, hack, like hack so violent. <laughs> this is how we want to be with this beautiful, beautiful response that's just trying to protect us. Oh, that doesn't feel right. And it totally makes sense because it feels bad. It can be really scary, particularly when we're just coming out of freeze and the numbness stops. And then we can feel fear and anger and all different kinds of things that the numbness is, is, um, helping us to not feel because it can be overwhelming. So of course we want to get out of it. So there can be compassion for that. And also, you know, with this practice, it's really important that we use every moment as best as we can as an opportunity for liberation. And we do that by being here with what is exactly as it is with kindness, we can, we can say to ourselves, sometimes it's just like this now. 
this is how it is. My nervous system is protecting me. I don't like how this feels, but this is how it is. And it seems really simple, but it's quite revolutionary. It's quite revolutionary. So when I was doing my somatic experiencing training, I um, got a little bit obsessed with this woman, MJ. <laughs> she was in my training. Um, she's like a Francophone um, equine therapist. And I really noticed in that training that I was just constantly finding the e equine as the horse. I was just constantly finding the horse therapy people unconsciously. And I was like, just so drawn to them. I was like, you guys understand something about nervous systems that I do not understand. And I want to be around you all the time. You're so safe. And so I was kind of like following MJ around and being like, can we eat lunch together? Like just being kind of a, a kindergartner who was like, I really want to be your friend. You're so cool. Um, and so when we were doing our experiential work, because the training is very experiential, we were put in, um, in pairs together to kind of um, experiment about nervous systems together. And so this was many years ago. And at that time I was, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely a giant trauma baby. Um, but at that time, my nervous system had significantly less capacity. And so, we, you know, we sat across from each other and just the eye contact that she offered me, even though I was obsessed with her and I was like, you feel so safe. I just, I just want to be in your arms all the time, you know, <laughs> but even then just the eye contact put me into freeze. My system was completely overwhelmed by attunement I didn't like it. I didn't want to be seen. It was a threat in my childhood history and probably in many of your childhood histories, being seen was a real danger, you know? And so being seen even by someone so loving was just so overwhelming for me, went right into freeze. And so the activity was just to notice what was happening in the nervous system and to offer some interventions if needed. And, you know, I've been in therapy for a long time, like 23 years. And every therapist I've ever had has been like, okay, how do we get you out of freeze? What do we do? You're always in freeze. What can we do? You know? And so I'm waiting for that to happen. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm in freeze. I know what this feels like now. And, and MJ is just kind of looking at me and being like, I see freeze. And we're like, okay, great. Um, and she's like, cool. So that's what's happening. And then we sat there for 15 minutes going. And while she just kind of made, you know, therapist sounds like, hmm. Ah, oh, freeze. Yeah. Mm. You know, <laughs> and she's like, mm, less freeze. Oh yeah. I see less freeze. And then she's like, I'm going to experiment with just turning my head away. And then because the threat was then taken away, right. The eye contact was the threat for me. She then, um, then my system kind of calmed down and I came out of freeze a little bit and then she came back in and it just became this like playful, fun thing that we were doing this game of, Ooh, let's watch our these nervous system, like deeply trusting in the resilience of my system to bounce back through this play. And at the end of it, I was shocked. I was like, why didn't you try to get me out of freeze? And she was like, what if there's nothing to be fixed here? What if there's nothing to be fixed here? What if this is just how it is in this moment? It's hard. It's not pleasant. <laughs> and this is how it is. And I wept and wept and wept. MJ held me, you know, it was my first time in all of those years of therapy where someone wasn't trying to make it different. Mm -hmm. Really, really, really trusting in the nervous system to come back to its wholesome state of regulation. Hmm. In um in Tibetan practice, they talk about this as inviting at, inviting everything that's here in for tea, inviting all the difficult things, all the beautiful things in for tea. And being with freeze is really, really, really challenging, not just because it feels bad, but because literally the parts of our brain that we use for mindfulness, our, our frontal kind of our prefrontal cortex, those parts of our brain is actually shut down when we're in this freeze collapse. And it's because our system is like, oh, the lion's about to eat us. So I'm going to take all of this extra energy that's that's being used in the brain and and um and put it and put it into suppressing the system so that there's no movement. So if we're trying to be mindful of freeze when literally that part of our brain is offline, that is incredibly difficult. Not impossible, but it's very, very challenging. And this is why it's so, so, so important that we have a regular mindfulness practice, whatever that might be, you know, it doesn't have to be a formal sitting practice, but any kind of being aware of what's happening in the present moment is so helpful because when you're practicing, when the stakes are low, 
it becomes automatic. But only practicing when the stakes are high, when your frontal lobes are offline, that is really, really hard. So it really is this kind of um, embodied practice. It's not like, oh, I've got to be mindful here. It's like the whole body knows how to be present with what is when it's easy or easier. Okay. So what is the intervention? How do we come out of freeze? Well, it really is what MJ offered me, which was safety, not judgment, you know? What was happening for me in that moment was the kind of second arrow, third arrow, fourth arrow of, oh, I'm in freeze and it's not okay, you know? The, again, like, so um, if you read the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha is often saying, um, you know, um, be like be mindful of what's happening internally and externally. I'm just thinking about um, in um, one of the meta phrases is um, may. Of course, now I'm blanking. <laughs> may you be free from harm, both internally and externally. Right? Yes. There you go. Yeah. So this phrase of internally and externally is really, really important because it's not always a lion. It's sometimes our own critical self judgments, right? Also a threat. So the way that we come out of freeze is by experiencing safety. So that can be um, not having the lion here anymore, right? Or it can be about an increase in our own capacity. And I'm, you know, of course, I'm thinking about systems of oppression, right? That lion doesn't go away. That lion is here. This is how our society is built. And so many of us, I think, I mean, I, I don't know if it's wild to say all of us are traumatized by those systems. Yeah. So it's not about, it's not about building capacity so that we can be resilient to oppression so that we can be like, oh yeah, oppression's here. It's cool. I've built my own individual capacity. I'm good. I can handle it. It's about, um, building the capacity so that we're not in collapse around it, but so that we can say, absolutely not. This is not okay. This needs to change. But it's hard to do that if we're collapsed. Okay, so the way that we can find safety with particularly those internal threats of self-judgment is through our practice of mindfulness, of course, right? Um, and their mindfulness is not mindfulness unless we're being really kind to ourselves. So the practice of noticing what's here with deep kindness, that is not just a, you know, an added suggestion. This is the most important part of mindfulness is deeply noticing with kindness. Um, my favorite Buddhist psychotherapist, David Rico, um, Wrote, has written many, many books. And um, in one of his books, he talks about um, how we can love each other. You know, how do you know that love is happening through like kind of a Buddhist psychotherapist lens? And so he came up with this, um, with this framework called the five A's. So um, let's say I, and I think he, he was talking about romantic love in this case. So he was, he's saying the way that I can offer love is by being affectionate, by um, showing up with attention, there being acceptance, allowing, and appreciation. So these are the five A's. I'll just copy and paste them in the chat. And if you sat with me before, then you know that I am kind of always talking about mindfulness as a self-love practice. So when it's like, well, how do I be kind to myself in this practice? You know, when kindness is hard to find, I will stick these words up at my altar, you know, and I'll just, if when I'm, before I'm doing a formal sitting practice, I'll just kind of look at them and be like, huh, can I offer this to myself while I'm practicing? Can I, can I be my own best friend? Can I be my own romantic partner? Um, affection, attention, acceptance, allowing and appreciation. And the Buddha also talked about, um, well, he, I, I'm, um, he didn't talk about being your own best friend. As far as I know, maybe he did. But um, because I think a lot about how can we be our own best friends in this practice, I was um, looking into a little bit um, of this, one of the suttas that he wrote or that he dictated um, called the Kalyanamitta Sutta. 
And the and Kalyana Mitta is the word for or the phrase for um, spiritual friend. And his um, loyal attendant cousin Ananda, you know, was listening to him speak one day and was saying, "Oh, I get it. Okay, spiritual friendship is like half of the path." And the Buddha's like, "No, and Ananda, spiritual friendship is the whole of the path." And then this is this is um, where he talks about what does it mean to be a good friend. So he talks about seven qualities of a good friend, and he says, for "A good friend says what's hard to say." does what's hard to do, endures what's hard to endure, keeps your secret, so I, I understand that as trustworthiness, and doesn't abandon you when you're in hardship or when you're struggling. Yeah. So these are also really beautiful words from the Buddha to put on your altar to be like, huh, how can I not abandon myself in this moment? How can I be really trustworthy to myself as in, you know, I'm saying to myself that I'm going to be kind in this practice. How can I show up with kindness? That's how we build trust with ourselves. How can I be with what's difficult? Yeah. Okay. So yes, every state in our body wants to be met with curiosity and with kindness and again curiosity comes from the part of the brain where our um our prefrontal cortex which is quite shut down so again it's really important that we're practicing curiosity all the time and we can do this in our formal practice and we can also just do this when we're out in the world like for me so much wonder and awe comes from being in nature right just being like look at this incredible flower look at how it's perfectly symmetrical i wonder how that happens I'm practicing curiosity with awe, and it's so much easier to do that with beauty. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so this is all easy to say, very difficult to do, particularly when we're in this kind of like constricted um, body mind space. So we often need help, right? When we're in freeze, we need help. You know, we've got this triple jewel that we find refuge in, the Buddha, the Sangha, and the Dharma. The Sangha is such an important piece of this. We need other people. If any of you are familiar with the term co-regulate, this is the idea that we are porous, right? We are deeply influenced by each other. And so when, if, if we have a safe um, person who's doing pretty okay in that moment and we're hanging out with them when we're feeling really, really bad, we often feel a little bit better just by being in their presence, you know? So that's what happened when this whole thing happened. Um, when Coral was like, Hey, can you send me the flyer? And I was like, I don't have capacity for this. I called a friend. I called a dear Dharma friend. And my friend Emiko just listened to me. You know, I was like, I'm having a really hard time migraines are so intense, like spiral, 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 just kind of like naming all of the second, third, fourth arrows. And she went, yeah, that sounds really hard. So there she is being my mindfulness, being my curiosity, asking me lots of really good, but easy questions, holding me with kindness, all the things that I couldn't do for myself. And this is what Sangha can offer offer us. I really like to think of this as co-mindfulness, you know? I don't always have the capacity to do it on my own. Can I get someone to kind of help me <laughs> to do the pieces that I can't do? Yeah. This really helps kind of dampen that threat response. Like whether the threat response is internal or external can be really helpful to just kind of um, to have someone else go, it's okay, sweetheart, when I can't do that for myself, you know, that's like the number one thing I'm saying to myself in my practice is holding the parts that hurt, particularly my head and going, it's okay, sweetheart. And sometimes I can't do that on my own. Okay. So we've talked about internal safety, right? Um, building internal safety through kindness, um, through asking for help. But we can also try to access environmental safety. And again, it's really helpful to do this 
to build a practice of this so that when there is deep freeze, when it's really challenging, your system's like, I know how to do this. I've been practicing this. And so for environmental safety, I think about, um, I practice a lot with Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. Um, um, yeah, who, who holds it all, you know, who has um, foregone um, Nibbana, has given up Nibbana so that she can be here with us, holding us in our suffering. That's what that's what she does. It's so beautiful. So we can be with Kuan Yin. In your practices, in your lineages, you may have someone like that too, who holds the suffering of the world. I've been working a lot with ancestors lately, doing all kinds of resourcing practices like the one we did earlier. Um, it absolutely, it can be going into nature and looking at a flower, but it can also be remembering that you looked at a flower. When we, yeah, when we don't practice rest, resting back and, sorry, I'm gonna start. There's something really beautiful about practicing resting back and into something. Resting back into the ancestors, back into Kuan Yin, back into 2,600 years of this lineage of every person who's meditated before us. So beautiful. There's so much holding us. And when we can practice doing that, when, then when there's a kind of threat of internal or external danger, we are already practicing resting back and into what's beautiful, what's true, what's here, what's safe, true refuge. I'm just thinking about like so often the I feel like the trauma response of capitalism, of living in capitalism is like this leaning forward, you know, um, trying to get things done, trying to do enough so that maybe I might be okay and worthy of care and love and basic resources. And so resting back is actually a really radical act. It really, really is resting back, but it's gotta be safe back there. you know. <laughs> and so we make it safe through this resourcing practice. Um, so very often I'll start my practices by just really, really noticing my back, noticing my back body, bringing in the ancestors, bringing in Kuan Yin, asking them all to hold my back. And then I'll start my practice. It's a good way of building a container. And it can kind of feel like, okay, wait though, I thought we weren't supposed to be so into sense pleasure. Isn't that the whole Buddhist thing? <laughs> right? Where, um, you know, when we crave after um, taste, like, ooh, ice cream, or um, sight, oh, beautiful flowers, or um, feelings, oh, um, this, this friend that I just love so much, I just want to like, hold, 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 whatever it is, all that kind of clinging creates suffering. And so how can we understand this practice of resourcing? Well, we can resource without clinging, right? We can notice what's pleasant. That's also a very important part of our practice. We're not just noticing what's difficult. We're also noticing what's pleasant. And the practice is to notice it and then be willing to let it go. Yeah. So we bring in the ancestors and then we let them go. We bring in Kuan Yin and we let her go. You know, the, the Buddha was a big believer in resourcing too. I don't think he called it that, but that's, that was a big piece of the work. You know, the very first lesson that he taught way before any kind of meditation was um, the lesson in generosity. This is the first teaching. And we know how wholesome generosity feels when we give, it feels so, so, so good. And it's important, he talks about how important it is to stay with how good those feelings are because it primes the body to then want to be more generous. Creating wholesome or noticing wholesome pleasure in the body is a beautiful foundation for the work of, uh, of being with what's here skillfully, particularly difficult things, right? Yeah. Another, another way that the Buddha kind of talked about resourcing or the way that I am understanding him talking about resourcing is um, the way that he talks about the bliss of blamelessness. 
Yeah, there's a deep joy in following our sila. So when we've got this sense of morality and we are not harming, right? We are not, um, um, yeah, when we're not harming other people or other beings, we carry this like deep joy of blamelessness. I didn't do anything wrong today. That's pretty great. Didn't hurt anything. That feels pretty good. And really being with that to kind of help fuel um, sila. Yeah. So the last little thing that I just want to mention is um, this idea that um, Deb Dana talks about, who is a nervous system theorist, nerd, clinical, or a counselor. Um, and she talks about how our nervous system state creates the story, right? So when Coral asked me, you know, about the information for the flyer, and I was like, I don't have the capacity. That was the story that got created. That was that arrow, right? And then once I met with my friend Emiko and I kind of calmed down a little bit, the story changed and it was like, oh, I do have capacity for that. And that's why it's so important in this practice that we stay with sensation and not so much buy into what the narratives are saying, even though they're incredibly seductive. Um, they often have less um, reliable information than the sensations in our body. Yeah. And that that's like very fundamentally decolonial, you know? Um, to be with the body instead of to be with the narratives. Okay, so let's do a practice. So two things about these practice about this practice. Um, we're gonna do exactly what I just said, which is we're gonna invite the we're gonna invite ancestors in. We're gonna invite um, Kuan Yin or your version of Kuan Yin. For you, that might be. Um, I think it's helpful. I think it might be helpful if this if this was um a being with like hands or paws, um so it can be a, a, a pet, but um a physical being might be helpful. Sometimes I like to work with the sun and the rays of the sun. So if that works for you, great. And also, you know, you can start working with an image. And if you're like, I don't, I'm getting lost in trying to get it right, just drop it and work with whatever's here. So we're going to work with a wholesome being that feels protective, that feels really, really caring, a being that you can just sink right back into. This can be the Buddha, this can be Kuan Yin, it can also be an activist you really admire, um, a really just loving person in your life. Yeah. Um, and then the other piece that we're going to do is we're going to add some charge into it. We're going to work with something difficult. So I'm going to ask you to work with a small conflict. And our bodies are amazing. And so our bodies are always trying to like figure out the trauma and like get to the source of all of the difficult things. And so it's going to take you, the body is naturally inclined to take you to the absolute worst thing that's ever happened to you. Um, and this is a real practice of discernment to be like, ah, oh, we don't work with what's hardest. So it's about saying to the body, thank you. I see that you're trying to take me to the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And I'm going to bring you back to the conflict I had with my um, roommate about the dishes, you know, we're going to work with that level of conflict. Okay. Great. Okay, so finding a posture that works for you, sitting, standing, lying down, walking. Walking might be a bit challenging, but if that's what works for you, that's great. And turning the attention inwards. And again, taking the moment, taking a moment to really notice the earth. Noticing the parts of your body that are touching the earth, that are being supported by the earth. And seeing if you can give even 1% more of surrender into the earth, surrendering just 1% more. Perhaps by rolling your shoulders back and down towards the earth.
perhaps by letting your jaw open a little bit. And let's take a moment to really notice our back. So just as we feel this downward pull of energy, downward pull of gravity, sorry. See if you can also notice these upward pull of dignity in the spine. You can imagine that there's just a little fairy at the top of your head, gently pulling a string to straighten the spine. And so holding both the downward energy and the upward energy. And then just gently scanning the back body. Noticing what's in the upper back. What's here right now? What's this like? And then the mid back. And then the low back. And so we'll ask our benefactor to come in and hold our back. So this might be a hand on the shoulder, a hand or a paw on the shoulder. It might be your hand on your back somewhere. Or you might notice, oh, that feels too close. I'm just gonna ask them to step back a little bit and just energetically support me. That's great too. So take a moment to play with it. I'm just noticing the expression on our beloved benefactor's face, expression. The energy of, I've got you. And see if you can allow yourself, just as you allowed yourself to surrender to the earth, see if you can allow yourself to surrender a little bit to the back to this benefactor who's really got you. We can call in of our ancestors. We're calling in our wise and well ancestors. And these may be people in our blood lineage, and it may also be queer ancestors, transcestors. There are so many ways to be family. we can ask them to also be at our back. Again, they might be right up touching us or they might be a few feet away. Whatever feels like the right level of support. Noticing the good intention on their face, their faces.
and again, seeing if you can surrender just a little bit more, resting back into their arms, either physically or energetically. Noticing how our back is strong, but also supple. And so I'd like you to pull up the conflict that we were talking about. And maybe it shows up as an image or you notice it as a sensation. And I'd like for you to start by placing it on the moon, far away on the moon. And so while it's way, way, way over there, we're gonna practice staying with our ancestors, staying with the Bodhisattva, leaning back, even when something difficult is, we know is approaching, but it's far away. Continuing to lean back. And so now we'll move the conflict halfway between the moon and the earth. It's kind of hang, hanging mid mid atmosphere. I'm just noticing the body. Oh, what does it feel like to have this conflict present? Does it feel like contraction, constriction? Is there tingling? their shortness of breath. Being curious with so much kindness. And can I also continue to remember, continue to practice leaning back and into our benefactors and our ancestors who are here to support us. And this is a practice, so if it's hard, that's okay. And we're gonna move the conflict into the Earth's atmosphere now. And it's going to land in China. So it's a little bit closer. Noticing the physical sensations of the conflict being closer and the emotional states that are showing up. Feeling into the hands that are holding us. Borrowing some of their ease some of their delight in holding us. We're gonna let go of the conflict. You might wanna put it back on the moon now. Or just kind of watch the image dissolve. And we're going to notice our benefactor and our ancestors and bow to them. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your unending support and presence.
I'm just resting for a moment, noticing what it was like to do that little nervous system workout. It's resiliency building. And you can come back to the larger group now.